We're going to be doing today my gluten-free soca from my book, Gluten-Free, Hassle-Free. It's a fabulous dish made with chickpea flour, salt and pepper, rosemary, olive oil, and just a little bit of shallots. But if you don't want to chop up any shallots, you could draw, do dried minced onion. It's the easiest gluten-free flatbread you'll find, and they do it in Venice, Northern Italy, and in France, and you can make a little pizza out of it, or you can keep the batter in your refrigerator, and you can heat it up later and make a beautiful, beautiful flatbread to eat with hummus or with any kind of a little dip that you have. So I'm gonna add my water to my chickpea flour. Whisk works nicely. Salt and pepper. Rosemary. The shallots. And again, the dried minced onion works great. And then I'm just gonna put like about two tablespoons of olive oil, and it's basically one part of chickpea flour, like so one cup of chickpea flour to one cup of water. And now we have it all whisked. We can let this sit for about a half an hour and we'll be ready to go. So now my soca has been sitting for about a half an hour and it's the perfect consistency just like pancake batter. Maybe a little bit thicker and you can make it almost any size you like. The size of your spatula and the size of your pan will dictate what size your soca will be. And you've got to make it just like you would if you were pouring pancakes into a pan, but we're going to kind of angle our pan around to cover the whole bottom of the pan, maybe like you were doing eggs even, or gluten-free pancakes, of course. So I'm gonna put a little tiny bit of olive oil in my already hot pan and swirl it around just a bit. And then I'm going to take a ladle and I'm gonna ladle a little bit of the soca batter into the pan. And I'm just going to like swirl it around until it coats the bottom of the pan. And we're gonna let that sit for just a couple of minutes and so that we could lift it up easily. Usually the first one's the hardest, so we just let it go for a couple of minutes. Now, the most important thing I wanna tell you about this recipe is not only is it quick and easy, and you can keep the batter in the refrigerator all week and be able to use it to make fresh batches of soca whenever you want it, one, two, three, but it's high in B vitamins and high in fiber. And most people that are on gluten-free diets don't get enough fiber, and they usually eat most starches, like potato starches and tapioca starch, because gluten-free products don't have the gluten, and the gluten's the thing that gives it the push, and so therefore they put these light starches in there to lighten up their baked goods, and they don't get what they need. So when you incorporate more beans in your diet, not only are you getting more fiber and nutrients, but you're also getting something that might help you with your cholesterol levels as well. So my soca is just starting to soften. I'm just gonna play with it a little bit around the edges. And as soon as you feel like you could lift it right up, that's when it's almost ready to turn. And then you leave it for a couple of minutes more, a couple of seconds more. You just lift it up and look underneath to make sure it's starting to brown. Now, if I happen to turn it too soon, I could return it again and brown it again, or I could slide it into the oven under the broiler with a little bit of olive oil and just broil it for a second. Some people like to put a little bit of cheese on the top of it and like diced tomato and make like a pizza out of it as well. I've been into restaurants where they've actually made it on a little metal pan and cooked it for a long time in the oven and finished it on the broiler just like a pizza and they called it a gluten-free pizza. So we'll just wait a little bit and then we'll flip our soaker and we'll have some yummy, delicious things to have. As you can see, I just flipped this and it's a little bit brown on that side. And you know, you can make the soca with different flavors. So like let's say you wanted to make it a little Mediterranean, you could put some cumin in there, you could put chopped parsley. Any kind of spices work well in a soca. I happen to like the rosemary with the minced garlic to the minced shallot, but everybody has individual tastes. Now you could crisp these up as much as you want and then they're absolutely perfect for parties, for like dips. Sometimes I'll wrap them in aluminum foil and bring it with me. And if somebody's grilling, I'll throw my aluminum foil pouch with my soakers on the grill and heat them right up. So let me just slide this down and I'll make up another one. Because you never can have too much soca to go around. And again, you could use cooking spray instead of the olive oil. I like the olive oil, it goes with that Mediterranean flair. Sometimes they even use chopped olives in my soca, which is, Another great way to go. You could hear it just sizzling in there. Now if you put too much soca batter in, no problem, because you just let it cook a little bit longer and it's a little thicker. And as I said earlier, if you want to make it crisper and it's not getting crisp enough in your pan, you could slide it right under the broiler. Put a little olive oil on the top and whatever topping you want. So we're gonna let that sizzle. Oh, 
Isn't that beautiful? And sometimes I will sprinkle a little bit of sea salt right on the top, just when it comes out. You know, when I have the olive oil and everything on it, it gets a nice, crisp, salty, savory taste. It's loaded with nutrients. I mean, what more could you ask for? It makes people that are not going gluten-free want to go gluten-free to eat something like this. And it's vegetarian, too. And again, as you start cooking them, it's almost like when you make a pancake or something like that, gluten-free pancake, of course, you have to, the first couple don't go as fast, and as the pan gets hotter and more seasoned, it goes boom, 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 because generally the pores of the pan itself actually absorb some of the oil when you're seasoning it, and as it heats, the oils get released through the pores in the metal itself, even though you think metal is solid, it does breathe a bit, even though it doesn't breathe the way we do. And as it gets more seasoned, it's easier to cook. And the next, the third, the fourth, the fifth even comes out better. So I've made big ones like this. I've cut them up and put them out at parties. They just make a great appetizer. You can make them any size you want. See, now it's almost ready to turn, but not ready to turn yet because I want to make it so that it's brown. And remember, if you flip, and it's too soon to flip. See, that's a little too soon to flip. I can flip it back. Soakers are very forgiving. It's apparently one of the only um, kind of doughs that you can make or batters that you can make that you could leave in the refrigerator for almost a whole week and just mix it together with a little fork and then put this together. So sometimes I'll be running and I'll get home for lunch and there'll be really not a lot to eat. And I can run to the refrigerator, mix up some of the soaker batter I have because it holds nicely. If I need to, I add a little extra water, cook a couple up and have it with anything that I have in the house for topping. So it really makes it very nice. And I never feel deprived when I have my soakers around. And by the way, if you pre-make a bunch of these, you can keep them in the refrigerator in aluminum foil and you can heat those up as well. I had said I did it on a grill. You could do it in the microwave, you could do it in the oven, whatever's easiest for you. And here we go, soaker number two. And I think I'm gonna put these under the broiler with a little bit of olive oil, sea salt, Parmesan cheese, and go for it. Mm -hmm. 